Good morning, Alistair. Uh, thank you very much for telling us uh, the history of Beam Hall or Beham Hall, where Willis lived and worked. What do you know about the history of this building? It came to my attention during a Corpus Christi governing body meeting, and I guess uh, I was taken back not just 400 years to Willis, but a further 400 years back to 1246 and Gilbert de Beham, who was the then ninth chancellor of the University of Oxford. And he, he lived there as a chancellor. And in 1252, when he handed over, it became an academic hall. And for 100 to 200 years, it was used as a medieval academic hall. It was taken over temporarily as the first printing press for Oxford in the 15th century. And then it reverted back to being a hall for students. And, and during that time, the name changed. The name changed from Beham to what was initially Bohem, B-O-H-E-M-E. And then uh, and perhaps it was in the vernacular to do with the beams in Beam Hall. It became Beam Hall, B-E-A-M-E, -E, before when Willis lived there, it became what we've always known it as, as Beam Hall. And I guess to celebrate the 800th uh, anniversary of Beham, Corpus Christi, who, who owned the house, wanted to rename it back to its original Beham Hall. And so after a governing body meeting in about 2014, the name was changed back to Beham and a new plaque has been placed uh, describing Willis's residence there in the 17th century. The reason that I'm so interested, of course, is that I've always imagined that this is where Willis did the first brain imaging. And, and of course, I'm interested in stroke. And I've always thought that when I came back to Oxford, when we started to do CT scans very quickly, that the first person to image stroke very quickly was, of course, Thomas Willis. And his imager and illustrator was Christopher Wren. And we, we, we've thought that this has been the home of the circle of Willis. And yes, when Willis was living there, it was known as Beam Hall. Willis always lived in, in England. He did not uh, travel himself, but he had um, amazing connections with people who did travel to Leiden, Paris, Padua. So do you think that not traveling as much, he was affected? His career. So it's interesting because, of course, um, Webfer in, in, in Switzerland in, in, in many ways had described the Circle of Willis, but whether he knew that, it was, it was of course, um, in, in a text in Latin, whereas, uh, as I described earlier, Willis had an uh, insight into seeing what was happening at the base of the brain, and it was his collaboration, if you like, with Christopher Wren that allowed the first imaging of the Circle of Willis, uh, despite the scholarship from the Low Countries and from Switzerland, which you may or may not have been aware of, it's quite clear to me that the imaging won out. And it was Christopher Wren's images of the Circle of Willis, which has, of course, led to the eponymous name, Circle of Willis. Without imaging, stroke would be nowhere. Without imaging, I don't think uh, we'd be calling it the Circle of Willis. So in many ways, I attribute the, the naming to the engravings of, of Christopher Wren. So how was this discovered by him? What was so revolutionary about his discovery? So we, we were looking very, very quickly after the death of a patient, or in many ways, they, they discovered clots in the arteries in patients, but they also took people that had been hung at Carfax and looked very quickly after people had been executed and could see in the fresh specimens the relationship of the arteries at the base of the brain to the substance of the brain in a way that was revolutionary because of the speed with which they looked in experience with acute stroke imaging in the last 20, 30 years, looking very quickly, we see the obstructed vessels, and that's how we've learned how to treat stroke, by seeing the arterial occlusion very, very early at a time when it's been possible to reperfuse the tissue by thrombolysing or using endovascular thrombectomy to remove the clot and achieve reperfusion. And that all goes back really to the observations of Willis uh, 400 years ago, looking very, very early at the cause of stroke or at the 
arteries in, 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 in normal subjects executed within an hour or so of their death. So seeing quickly, seeing is believing. Willis always believed you need to see it. He was the first person to see these things. And Christopher Wren's images have, uh, have really stood the test of time. He also had very interesting ideas about headache. And, and it links to vasculature. And, uh, and he also had some other suggestions for even, even restless leg syndrome and other uh, neurological cases. What is your favorite Willis discovery? Oh, I, I think the favorite one is, of course, the one that everybody talks about. He, he really discovered neuroprotection. And I, when, I, when I talk about neuroprotection and we talk about all of the glutamate antagonists and all the ways we've got of changing excitotoxicity in the nervous system, actually, if you go back to Anne Green, a poor, young, uh, thin, probably uh, hypoglycemic, certainly hypothermic uh, young girl, that was resuscitated after a failed uh, hanging at Carfax. She was resuscitated successfully, despite the, the duration of time when she probably had had some kind of cessation of cerebral perfusion. And the reason she recovered was, of course, what we now understand to be very, very um, key to the physiological protection of the brain, dropping glucose, dropping temperature, working with, with young subjects. And this is, of course, what we've discovered from the animal models of resuscitation 400 years later. Mm. Willis probably was the first person to, to do an effective resuscitation unwittingly, but he was also actually the first person to describe, I suspect, how those physiological conditions allowed the brain to recover. So, uh, Alastair, um, Willis was a giant. He could combine clinical practice, teaching, education, publishing uh, all together. And um, one could say that he was a superb medic because of the excellent education, but, the, but it's not the case. He, he hardly studied medicine just for a few years. In those days, medical school was 14 years and they had to learn Aristotle and Galenus uh, by heart. And um, that probably that 14 years killed out any uh, critical thinking and initiative from these medics. So Willis escaped uh, from all this and he started practicing because of the civil war uh, quite early. So uh, do you think it's better not to have a medical education if, <laughs> if, the, if the training is, is bad? Uh, I, I, I think he was surrounded by people in Oxford, the Hooks, the, um, I guess, the uh, Boyles, the uh, Wrens, the Locks, the, the people that obviously went on through Gresham to form the Royal Society. He was a very, very, in a very multidisciplinary environment, one which I think has always been helpful for thinking differently. Secondly, he, I think, was uh, someone who, beyond the observation and ensuring uh, that illustrations were made and that it was documented, were, were really making it possible to make accurate recordings of the observations. So Willis, just like Vesalius, didn't accept anything. He did not see with his own eyes. And That's right. Probably that's a very, a very, very positive virtue to have, even now. So when we teach final honor school students, I, I always tell them that, you know, it's, it's better not to have, you know, a, a dogmatic uh, education. You shouldn't believe anything we tell you unless you are completely convinced. So that's why critical thinking is important. And you have to have some medics who change the course of medicine. And, uh, Correct. and, and I, I think, uh, that's why we should be very cautious. And uh, medicine is sometimes based on traditions, history, rather than evidence. So, so but from, from my point of view, it's you know the, the most important things to support in the medical science division have been the quality and the excellence of the observations and the, the, the technologies. He had both of that. He had the, uh, at the time, he had the ability to observe, he had the technology to image, um, secondly, I think multidisciplinarity is absolutely key, and, and, and he was in this environment that was truly multidisciplinary. The disappointment that I have for Willis 
uh, is that because of the civil war, because of what was happening, he didn't have the international connections that were there. He just wasn't able to to enjoy what we have come become used to before, dare I say it, COVID and before Brexit. And I think the biggest threat to, to Oxford going forward is, is how we maintain our true uh, position as a European centre of scholarship that knows no let or hindrance and is not impeded by national borders. What do you think is the message from Willis to today's medics and uh, medical students? Look with your own eyes and look very quickly. <laughs> so and document in, it with in, the right in, technology. Alistair, thank you so much for... Thanks. Uh, discussing. Okay, take care.